for offending. And contrary to the media's claim that pedophilia is at the root of most online sexual abuse, sexual attraction is only one of many reasons behind why adults perpetrate these crimes. Other factors include mental disorders like depression, poor impulse control, goals, desire for power and to engage in deviant acts, impulse control, and generally antisocial uh, character. So it goes back to the complexities of problems. It's not easy to say, okay, the, this person right here is going to be an obvious perpetrator for this. So, um, And also the, the very uh, definition of, of, of pedophilia is, um, is, is, I guess, sort of up for grabs. Adolescents aren't counted. As that, and so we see in, in the uh, the literature here and the data uh, that a lot of these things happen between um, if you're thinking about adults and so-called minors, it's it, the perpetrators can be folks in their twenties, and the um, uh, the um, victims, folks in their you know, who are sixteen or seventeen, just maybe slightly. Um, under the age, so there's some uh, difficulties there when it comes to just sort of defining uh, what 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 the the perps are in the first place, and then of course we know a lot of this stuff just like rape um, is underreported. So a lot of the stats out there we just don't know uh, simply because of so much stuff is underreported. Um, Five, sexual solicitation and uh, internet-initiated offline encounters. So this is the idea that, okay, a perpetrator uh, solicits some sort of sexual activity uh, online, and then it goes to, you know, Motel 6. Um, and it is obviously a parent's worst nightmare. But what the book says is that it's... It, it's does not happen all that much. Um, it, it's it's um, it's it's not common. Um, and they talk about how we sort of live in a hyperbolic world, uh, which is very very true. There's a lot of media studies about how how the media presents news and, and how that creates a sense of, of um, illogical fear. And, and, and even as we see all these images in Gaza, it's horrible stuff. I mean, you've seen the news about one of our students, um, and all, and the Ukraine. I mean, we, we you know, the, the old adage for, for journalism: if it bleeds, it leads. So we have this sense that the world is is a much more violent place than it actually is. If you go and look at you know statistics and stuff like that, uh, oftentimes it, it's the world is a, a safer than it, we actually think it is. Um, but nonetheless, it doesn't, that doesn't mean that this isn't a problem by any stretch of the imagination. But this is in the middle of um, uh, page uh, 370. I think there's some important stuff there. Uh, the reality is that few online solicitations lead to offline encounters, as many of these contacts are merely harassing or teasing, and physical abductions of children following from online meetings are nearly non-existent. Uh, when online, of course, remember, this this book comes out in, in 2011, which means the, the stuff that was written for this book is a, a few years earlier than that. Um, when online meetings develop into offline sexual encounters, they are most common between pairs of adolescents and between older adolescents and 20-somethings. Um, and then it moves on uh, to the idea of, of the stranger danger. It says, while this stranger danger rhetoric is pervasive, um, that is fearing strangers reaching out uh, to, uh, to minors via uh, CMC and soliciting sexual uh, uh, favors or whatever, sexuality, sex, and then taking them out to, to some uh, horrible place. Um, it is not effective at keeping kids safe. Um, because 95, that is, focusing on the stranger uh, as, a, as a way to d deter all this is, is, not a, um, it, it, it is not effective because 95% of offline sexual assault cases reported to authorities are committed by family members or known acquaintances. Dire predictions about the threat of Internet-initiated sex crimes committed by strangers appear to be, appears to be exaggerated as the vast majority of sexual abuse of youth still occurs 
offline between known parties. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, at least what the research says is that uh, oftentimes we have this hyperbolic thing, a, a view of, of this, even though there certainly are cases. Um, so then they move to a, uh, uh, on page 371, I'm on slide six now, just sort of um, ideas of sexual solicitation generally. They sort of go back and forth, and they, they sort of define what it is. It's broadly defined as an online communication where someone on the Internet tried to get a minor to talk about sex when they did not want to. An offender asked a minor to do something sexual they did not want to do or other sexual overtures coming out of online relationship. Um, you, you, you know, it gives you lots of various uh, uh, stats um, from the youth and internet safety surveys. Um, 13 to 19 percent of youth have, have experienced some form of online sexual solicitation. Uh, given the anonymity of communication, it is often possible to object objectively assess the age of solicitors. Nevertheless, youth report that they believe that 43 percent of the solicitors were under 18, so minors soliciting minors, 30 were between 18 and 25, 9 were over 25, and 18 were completely unknown. Um, so we don't know how old they were. Um, and some folks don't even see this as a big deal. Um, some see it as this flirting between uh, minors and, um, or, you know, Sorry, you had to have a bark at the last, uh, the last uh, uh, lecture here. Um, so I'll let you read the, the, the stuff here. Um, I think um, it, basically they're saying there's not a whole lot of, of studies here. Um, and I like what, what the stuff that uh, Bark uh, says from 2005. Uh, basically saying that um, he applied this model to sexual harassment on the internet, his model, and argued that online disinhibition, openness, venture, venturesome attitudes, and a masculine atmosphere were instrumental in online sexual harassment. So it's also the gendered aspect of this, perhaps, that, that helps it along. Um, and, you know, what about the adults? There's some important stuff um, uh, on the bottom of page uh, 371, moving up to 372, the book says, There are several reasons why online solicitations, although some are designed to entice youth into offline sexual relationships, are quite dissimilar to those of the media-propagated image of the pedophile enticing children to participate in either offline or online sexual encounters. Neither online solicitations nor internet-initiated relationships particularly tend to target prepubescent children. When offline sexual encounters occur, they happen multiple times, and significant deception is uncommon. Um, so, it's often, I mean, you know, it's... So, so some of the things that we think, the horror stories that we think, are not necessarily uh, the case. Um... Although, obviously, this is uh, disturbing, um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, when uh, uh, folks were solicited, uh, they certainly uh, felt psychological uh, distress. So it's not like it's not a problem, um, but some of our worst fears are, are simply the, the academic research says it's, it's not necessarily the case. Okay, seven. What about solicitation and offline contact? Uh, most does not seem to be sexual. Um, and I'm on slide uh, seven now, as I just said, um, when it moves to talking about offline contact um, on page 372. Um, and basically, uh, the idea is that what happens if you have a so solicitation online and it moves to an offline encounter, it's that the, the the relationship and what happens is very, very similar to statutory rape. So when you see on the page of top 373, sort of, uh, in the small number of offline meetings between minors and adults that are involved, uh, that involve sex, the offense typically followed a model of statutory rape. A post-pubescent minor had non-forcible sexual relations with an adult in their 20s. 
So again, we're thinking about you know, 20 year olds and folks who are uh, 16 or 17 or so. Um, so says you know this particular uh, research. But I do think the last um, section or last paragraph in that section is, is important. Uh, the, what what they're doing here, as you can see, I mean they're they're trying to showcase that the, all our worst fears. Um, particularly when it comes to, to, to CMC and pedophiles, are probably not warranted, even though there certainly are cases. But that does not mean that this stuff is not dangerous. So, you know, basically this is what they say. This does not diminish the illegal nature of statutory sex crimes, but signals an opportunity to reorient the message provided to youth about how these crimes typically unfold. Uh, they are certainly not benign relationships, and some are psychologically harmful to youths. At the same time, it is important to recognize the role that teens play in these types of relationships because if some young people are initiating sexual activities with adults they meet on internet, which is often the case, we cannot be effective if we assume that all such relationships start with a predator or criminally inclined adult. So we need to sort of rethink sometimes how we think all this stuff sort of goes down. Um, Victims and perpetrators of online sexual solicitation. So, so again, um, they're talking about sort of the characteristics. Most uh, are adolescents um, who are solicited, right? Um, so they're not pu pre pubescent. Pu pu I can't even say the word puberty. They have yet gone through puberty. They don't talk like this. Oh, that would be puberty. Uh, obviously, more females are solicited than males. Well, not obviously, but that's what the uh, that's what it says. Uh, oftentimes, um, the folks who are solicited, who 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 are sort of in a way, sort of uh, uh, are part of the risk factors, are also experiencing offline difficulties, like being uh, physically or or sexually abused um, already. Um, so, and uh, also there's lots of, of, of stats, uh, and I'll let you read all the various stats. There's so much demographic information here, but it all sort of boils down to um, the youngest kids aren't typically, are, are, are not typically uh, the victims. It's usually, uh, you know, folks 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, it says 99% of the victims of internet uh, initiate sex crimes arrests in the uh, in the NJOV uh, study uh, were aged 13 to 17, with 76 being high school age, 14 to 17, and none younger than 12. So, and, and what uh, this I thought this was sort of interesting because oftentimes we think uh, that the youngest folks are at risk. Um, and they say that's not the case. Uh, we think the youngest are at risk because they don't know too much about technology, but it's the folks out there using the technology that are more at risk. So they say this is a perspective that is at, odd, that is at odds with studies and programs that have equate younger age with greater risk due to lack of understanding of how new technologies work. So pretty interesting there. Okay, given that information, um, they move then to the different section. All that stuff was about sort of online sexual solicitation. Then they move to online harassment and cyber bullying, and they try to define it. Um, and uh, I, some say it's the same thing. Some say it's different. Um, it starts with cyberbullying is defined as an over-intentional act of aggression towards another person online, a willful and repeated harm inflicted through the use of computers, cell phones, um, and other electronic devices, uh, contact that, that threatens, embarrasses, or humiliates youth, involves private, uh, so like text messaging, semi-public, uh, like on an email list, uh, public communication, like on a website or Facebook. Um, and so, uh, and it also says, uh, because the actual location of bullying may be away from school setting, uh, it's, it's, it's more pervasive um, on the Internet. 
Uh, and then it says cyberbullying and online harassment have